and welcome to another exciting episode of Behind the Tactics Board with Jamie Harrison and myself, Stuart B. Holmes. Coming up on today's episode, we're going to be talking about structures around team talk. So what have we done this week with Zaletto? So we've been out again to watch Mark Challen. This week he's been working on defending with his group of players. We spoke last week about the small details that he had to the session. We've been very fortunate that that's the third week now we've gone out and watched him. Every week has been excellent. It's um, You can see how hard the players have worked and that's through no, no mistake. That's through how Mark drives the session. Mark has allowed us to come and watch his sessions. Um, we've even put it on TikTok Live as well for, for the viewers to observe how he, how he does it. But he's also allowed us to stay afterwards and um, ask him questions and what the viewer asks on, on the TikTok Live as well. So we've managed to put a few questions to him. One of them was about what he thinks makes an excellent player. And here's a clip of it. Well, they have to enjoy it because it, it takes an incredible amount of dedic dedication. I always say to them, the players, that you need to have silk and steel. So you need to have silk in terms of like uh, touch and vision and passing and dribbling. But in, most importantly, especially in England, you need to have steel. So like we're in December now, aren't we? It's starting to get two degrees, minus one degrees, wind, rain, I think then you really find out about a player who, who's a real a proper player and who's just a sort of plays at it and can only do it in certain temperatures. So they need to they need to work hard, they need to enjoy what they're doing, but they need to have silk and steel for me. That was great for Mark, wasn't it? Yeah. So with your old role of being the Kevin manager, what do you see, uh, what do you believe makes a player move on to the next level? Yeah, so... We've seen players that have gone on and progressed on to, to play in a professional game. Now, those have a, quite a similar characteristic, like they do extras. Now, something I tried to tell my sons as well, that if you just do the basic session and the team session, that's great. That does, you have to do that. That will make you a good player. But then what's the next step to make you the very best? And if well, Ronaldo is an example of... of what the extra bits he does to look after himself in order to prolong his career, but also to make him the best player he can possibly be. So ones I've come across myself, um, with the under 18s who have then gone on and progressed into bigger academies. Um, and there's one in particular who had gone on from league two, he's gone on to the championship team. They would, they would do an extra. So they're doing a team session, but they're doing all the extra stuff without the coach asking. They would go out, take a bag of balls out, work on their passing, work against a bounce board, work on their crossing, work on their finishing. Um, there's one example, he was a, a goalkeeper. In a very short space of time, he improved himself so much with his, with his distribution through the team sessions, but the extra work he would then put in on his own. He added on to that, the physical element so alongside the program that we gave him he would then also spend time in the gym so one night on going around locking up the facility that we use and, and then this kid's in the gym working away and then it's no no fluke yeah. that he's the one that goes on and gets he got scouted by Southampton and he went on to be signed pro, pro deal with Southampton um, so there's no it's no no fluke yeah. that, he, that he did that I saw uh, something with uh, Phil Neville um, a little while ago, and some of the things he learned to do as he was growing up, growing up and being part of uh, probably the first team or around the first team, was even the little details some of these elite players do, and the minute they get up, so the clothes they wear to make those right for their body for their training, and even when they're driving in, making sure they're starting their hydration, that they're, they're drinking the right things, they're eating the yeah. right things. Um, every single detail of their life, I mean, and it's extreme elite level, but it just goes to show that at that stage where they've just got that 1% is, if I can start my hydration early, that means I'm going to be ready for training. That means I'm going to put in a better training session. And they get in and they do that extra bit of stretching, yeah. that again, pro prolongs their career or makes them that little bit faster. Mm -hmm. they, they small, fine margins. Now, if we bring it that back down to uh, the lower levels, um, this can also be achieved by anyone. Mm. Now, I really believe that through the practice, 
you can become better. It has to be focused practice. It's um, deliberate practice is what they call it. It's not just going out and being thoughtless with what you do. You're not going to get better that way. It's going out with that focus, right? I'm going to work on my first touch. We're playing it against the wall and where's my first touch going to go? And then you're working at a match tempo with deliberate practice. I really believe you can get better for if you consistent with that extra practice. Um, and you, you can make big improvements. Now with, with this extra practice, is normally everyone works on their weaknesses, don't they? So they would go, let's say, I'm, I'm right footed, so I'll go and work on my left foot, which is great. Work on your weakness, definitely, because that will improve your game. But it's also work on your strengths. So why am I picked in that starting 11? Or what is the reason the coach is going to pick me for that starting 11? normally it's because you bring that different something to the yeah. game that no other player can bring. <clears throat> so then how do you make that strength even better? Super strength, we call it in the, in the academies. How can you make that super strength? So through that extra practice, can you make that even better, even sharper? Yeah. No, that's brilliant. I, I, again, <clears throat> I remember uh, Timo Becky was interviewed. So there's that famous goal he scored against Greece. And he mentioned the day before, he went out and he his free kicks after free kicks around the penalty area and Zali had that particular spot where he scored it from so he put in the hard work the day yeah. before and then obviously we all know the moment it's happened. brilliant yeah I've seen that on YouTube that clip of and he again we talked about failure earlier yeah he failed <clears throat> many many times yeah but then that led into that one moment yeah. against Greece was it yeah? yeah against Greece because of that extra practice he put in and then to go to the Euros because of that yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then, so I look at an example of of Andy Robertson. In, what a player he is, yeah. you know, amazing left back. He does everything brilliantly, I think. But there's still that one element he can improve on, which is maybe the crossing. Mm -hmm. If he can, even Andy Robertson, as good a player is, as he is, if he's doing that extra bit of work, he's going to become one of the best left backs in yeah. the world. Um, to then turn, he's supplying. 10 out of 10 times, five good crosses, can he do that extra bit of work in order to make that seven times out of 10? Now that will add another assist to his game yeah. and it become even, you know, it, it will then be held up as one of the best yeah. left backs uh, in the world. Definitely. Okay, so you spoke about last week, uh, the podcast you've been listening to and you've even been on the, the tour that they've done with Jake Humphreys. Is there any other book or podcast you've been interested in this week? Uh, this week I've, listen to uh, a book called the 5am club um, and it's all about planning your day motivate your day make the most out of it so i'm not suggesting you get up at 5am um i tr trial it a little bit but mine's more 6 6 30 yeah, yeah um but it's just about having having that moment to start your day to optimize and make the most of it um, yeah it's not about necessarily with the waking up is it no at that certain time even though I think when you've done it, and I, I, did, I did this during the first lockdown. Oh, okay. You did, I, I got a lot done. You do, <laughs> yeah, you do. But I was tired. Yeah. The day. But it's not necessarily about what time you wake up, it's, it's how you start off your day. So yeah. what was the... Yeah, so there were some people like to you know, get the worst chores out of the way and then they've got plenty of thoughts in. Um, for me, I use the time to actually do a bit of planning for my sessions. Because it's nice and quiet, I ain't got to start for work yet, family's in bed, <laughs> so I can just concentrate, start planning, uh, and I'm just planning the session, I'm gonna, I start to plan what I'm going to say to players, who's going to be my primary player within the session, what do I need to say to them, is it going to be relevant, How you, know, uh, you have to think about how you're going to be talking to that player as well. So all these small little details um, is, is what I made the most of it. Um, and some of the other things I took away from the book was, uh, so the book's more about motivation, positivity, and a little bit more about business, I suppose. Um, but in a sense, it's all relevant to football. It's about building yourself around the right people. Mm -hmm. Everyone's got an opinion about football. Um, and if you want to build yourself as a coach, as a player, try and be around like-minded people. So there's no point talking to people who maybe not on the same page as you, how you see football, if you want to learn. You know, if you're speaking to somebody who wants to play a type of football that's totally opposite to you, you're not really going to get so it's about building your own network of, of people who are like minded to yourself. Um, and something that you've already mentioned previously is about that, that hard work. You know, the hard work overall 
long time ago at this point. Um, being dedicated and committed to something that you want to achieve. So there was a lot within the book, obviously not related to football, but still a lot of it I was able to apply to myself and apply to my business. What was other key messages from the 5am? They, they have a certain, they have a guide of what you should do in that first hour, they call it a power hour or something like yeah, that. They yeah, they do. Yeah. And there was a formula, uh, 20, 20, 20. Yeah. So it was sort of uh, you know, a bit of meditation to get your mind sorted, 20 minutes physical activity to, to get your body ready. And then uh, uh, twenty minutes of, of, of planning or uh, reading or you know just 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 getting yourself ready. So there's that little formula of you know, 20, 20, 20. And then how have you found? Has that improved your? It has. Um, I think we're all creatures of habit. So creating routines, I think, is very good. Um, and it, it's just that start your day. So you, my body then goes through this little pattern. It knows what's happening. Um, I'm doing the bits that I enjoy, and then I'm ready to start. Do you think you become more productive then? I think so. I think, again, like you mentioned, it's not to get up early because you need to be appointed for your appointment again at 5 a.m. Um, so it's just creating your day longer, isn't it? And if by doing something, you're then more productive, so then you've created something. And because it's something I enjoy, getting up early is then good for me. Getting up early because I'm making something I enjoy. Mm. So when it, this time of year when it's really dark and cold outside, sometimes you can just get downstairs and be like, well, so to get up and go, no, I'm getting up and maybe doing some other stuff or, or planning of the sessions, yeah. um, or just even just working on team talk or, or anything, or even just a moment just to go, I'm going to listen to something or read something, um, is, is, uh, it's been really, really fun for me. Um, so then how has it transferred into your, so you say you have that extra time of planning, has that improved what you've been delivering? I think so. I think it's not just the session itself, I'm more conscious of what I'm saying to players, who I'm speaking to, and making sure that the detail within the detail is starting to hopefully appear for the individual players. So as we spoke about some of the finishing sessions earlier, it's not just about creating the sessions, but like, who do I want to speak to? Why do I want to speak to them? What am I going to say? Yeah. And, how, and how am I going to say it? Rather than, mm -hmm. So it's the detail within the detail. That's brilliant, yeah. Because quite often, coaches come up with their session yeah. in the drive over to the session. Yeah. So that extra bit of time you're giving yeah. yourself just just allows you to benefit your players that much more. Yeah, I think that's also a key thing to say, because I'm sure we've all done it, you know, driving and going, what am I going to do tonight? Um, and then, yeah. put, again, put you under pressure. You're then thinking about what you're going to be doing next. So then you're not focusing on the players. And the whole session is just completely different. So yeah. if I can turn up with a session and go, I know exactly what I'm doing, 100%, give you that little bit of confidence as well. Yeah, brilliant. That bit of confidence. And just that extra lit, just that extra little bit of detail you can give each player, and how you, like you say, even the way you put it across yeah. to that player is, is really well considered. Yeah. So I've had this conversation with a coach this week also, as he said, well, the reason why I don't plan is because, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the reason why I don't plan is because I plan, 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 and then that player doesn't turn up. Yeah. Yeah. So. Exactly. Now, what I said to him in through my um, early days, like I, I've spoken about already, I had a thousand, so I'm looking to do a thousand terrible sessions. Yeah. yeah. Normally, in those early ones, when they were terrible, it's because I didn't prepare. Mm. And I knew it was completely my fault. I didn't prepare in the level of detail that I wanted to. So in that, by self-reflecting and being honest about myself, I then went and made sure I got the planning right. Now, if that player, Bobby, doesn't turn up in that session, I've still put in that extra little bit of work that is, is, is in my head yeah. that I know whenever I, he does turn up, yeah. I'm, I know that, that how I'm going to yeah. talk to him. I've thought about that player's game in, a, in greater detail, and that is going to benefit me at some point. And also, if your, if your session's about a uh, phase, then part of your plan would be if Bobby doesn't turn up, He's my next plan would Yeah, that, that's all part of the detail, exactly. Yes, and that's why again, what I said about the planning was I like to know exactly what position everyone's going to be. Yeah. Now, we've had it where five players haven't turned up. Yeah. And you almost feel like, oh, I've got to rip up the. <laughs> but actually, by having everyone planned out, it's actually easier then to swap. Okay, Bobby isn't here. Little Johnny isn't here. 
they come out, they go in. Yeah. And you, you know you're better prepared, yeah. you're, easy, and you're easier adaptable um, for any situation that, that arises. Was there any other things you picked up from the book? Um, one, one thing also was uh, there was a comment about um, if you look in the bonnet of the car or don't judge a book by its cover. I think classic sayings. But I also think that that's relevant to coaches as well. Um, what do you mean by that? So when a player turns up, I think we can be very quick into judging. I'm sure you know, we can all see we can, what needs to be worked on straight away. But at the same time, we're just looking at the player, we're not really looking at the person straight away. And I think it's very important that we do give players time. Uh, more important just to sell it. I think that the environment we, you know, we know is really, really important nowadays. And once the player settles, you might see them smile a little more. You might see them chat to somebody they've never spoke to before. I think it, it's quite overwhelming when it could be an eight-year-old, a twelve-year-old, doesn't really matter, come into a new team um, and not know anybody. And we don't really maybe appreciate actually how hard that is. So we have to give them time to settle yeah. in. And as soon as they're smiling, chatting, all of a sudden you might see them just progress a bit more. And you're it's actually doing something. Okay, so it's almost like the first two to four weeks of them attending sh shouldn't it really be about the football exactly. you know and they, they shouldn't be judged on on their football ability yeah. with that have you what do you do in those first that first month that with a new player that comes in and i think that's where the coach has to step forward lots of conversation um reassurance to the player making sure they're happy making sure they're enjoying the sessions because obviously that's paramount isn't it you know we always want to make sure players are enjoying what they're doing um, and just keeping an eye on making sure that they're always included. You know, don't let them, you know, if there's a group of players, don't let them on one, one side, let them get back in there. Just get them involved as much as possible, but not forced. It has to be encouraged. Um, and if they do worry, you know, when they go up five, five minutes, you know, at the back of the group, let them do that, but then make sure they get back in. Yeah, we've seen it so many times where, so we operate a junior Premier League club. So if anyone who doesn't know what that is, there's the grassroots clubs, <clears throat> there's the grassroots clubs, and then above that is the junior Premier League level. So it's meant to be the best of the best players that are then selected to play to playing fixtures against um, better players. And then above that is the academy. So there's a pathway. So grassroots, I really believe, is for everybody. You should everyone should have access to it. And then it's those players that are then ready for an extra challenge can go in the junior premier league and then from that the, the pro clubs come in and cherry pick who is the most outstanding player and then they, they form the academies so there's that pathway and i've seen it so often that the junior premier league is a is a very high standard and it, it, it does take that bit of adjustment for a player that has only ever experienced grassroots football there is that extra bit of demand it's maybe a little bit quicker than, than what they would normally find. Um, and because they're meant to be with a, a squad of, they're all good players now, it, it is that extra, it is tough to, to succeed. And it does take that little bit of time to adjust. I've also seen it from a junior Premier League or grassroots going into an academy setting. Yeah. Um, I've seen, it does take, there's a reason why they, they've extended the trial period at academies to eight weeks now. It used to be come in for a, a week and then we're, we're, we can make a call on you now. The eight weeks is there, so it does, gives that a little bit of adjustment. So I know from observing players in academies, that first four weeks, they are just adjusting to the level. Because again, the, the academy football is that little bit more physical, a little bit stronger, a little bit quicker. Um, the standard of play is even higher and it does take that little bit of time for these players to adjust and once they they figure out oh right i've got to move that fraction of a second quicker they adjust their game at that little bit then they start to succeed and i've seen it so many times in in these trials so we've got a viewer's question come in about team talks so mm -hmm. i'm sure you've done hundreds over the years um so go through what you would do on a team talk on match day try to limit the number of points I would make. So instead of trying to cover everything that happened in that period, um, there might be 10 things that, that happened. If you, you can focus on maybe one or two and really nail down the detail, that, that would really benefit the players. I've, I've been guilty of this in the, in the past myself, of during a team talk, just talking at the 
kids, just telling them things that I've seen them do during a game and just talking at them, hoping that one bit of information will, will stick with them. Now, what I've caught myself doing, and I'm trying to change how I deliver it now, is I would bring the players in and I would just be doing all the talking. So I believe you need to involve the players more and ask questions and give their, so they have to provide their understanding. There's no point me just telling them because I can't kick the football for them or I can't, the, the game of football is, is so complex and they need to understand the, the problem that they're facing and how they're going to adjust in that moment. So we give them guiding principles. What I have been guilty of is, is talking to the whole team and probably because of an, an ego thing, a point that I want to make to Bobby, little Bobby over there, which would only benefit Bobby, I've talked to the whole team about it, saying, Bobby, you should have done this. Now that's an ego thing because I want to show everybody yeah. that I have that knowledge, whereas now I've, I've, I've identified that on myself and I've tried to structure it in a new way. So there's, and there's three different parts of my team talk right now. So there's one which is pl completely player led. There's one bit where I talk to the whole team and then there's another part of it where I then talk to the individuals. So it, instead of talking to Bobby in front of the whole team, I then go and just speak to, to Bobby just maybe 10 seconds before he goes out on the pitch and give that extra bit of information that will benefit him while one of the other coaches is talking to another individual. Um, and then that way that that communication, that, that message lands better with, with little Bobby. So there's different parts now we're trying to do with, with my team talk. The first part, which I've, I've really changed, is now giving ownership to the players to, to talk amongst themselves to identify what has just happened in that period. Things they've done well, things they could improve on. Now this is what I've done differently, is if we've there you go. If I'm, if I'm the big coach, normally you form a circle and they would just, you, you would set it up that, okay, players, what do you think? How do you think that's gone? And then what have you done well? What, what can you do better? Now, if I'm the coach and I'm, the group is around me, they aim their conversation at me yeah. and they're checking whether what they're saying is right. Yeah. Now, what I've done recently is I've, I've asked them to form a close circle so they're talking to each other and I've just stood within earshot so I can hear what's going on but it's not about me now yeah. it's all about the players and they're talking to each other and it's been brilliant I must say I've tried it with under nines all the way up to older players I think under 15s was, 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 I tried it last week and they can actually identify a lot more things than we as coaches can. And I've listened to the conversations. Um, if they're going off in the wrong direction, that's the time when I might step in. Or I might step in when they said the right thing. They just need that extra layer of detail yeah. added to it. Okay, that's brilliant. This is why. This is who should do that, how they should do it, why, why they, they're doing it. Um, but most of the time, they have... They've done the team talk for me. The, the things that I, the three points that I wanted to cover, they've pretty much covered them and they've spoken about it in a better way than I ever could. So it also allows you to then check what is their understanding themselves, not just what's in my head and think. Um, there's a query, isn't there? If you're told something, you'll forget it. Yeah. If you're uh, taught something, you can learn it. But if you're involved, you'll develop it. Yeah. It's not that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was the uh, we as coaches, as teachers, we believe everything we say, you will pick up and learn. Yeah. And there's a saying which I butcher a lot of sayings. <laughs> I love I love quotes, but I, I, I can't say them word for word. But it's um, it's not necessarily the learning of the of the player the pupil in the, in the classroom is what the message that they take away from that conversation it's not everything that I've said because they might only take away 10% of it so it's what actually lands and through different methods of player led the coach led way 
the individual chat, there's all different methods that will hopefully have uh, a higher success rate of that that learning to take place. Quite often, I do this with the younger kids and I do it with the older kids, I, I say an arrival activity, an eight-year-old can explain to an, another eight-year-old in their own language yeah. 10 times quicker and 10 times more effectively yeah. what the, the session practice we're, we're putting on looks like yeah. um, compared to, I might take <laughs> five minutes to explain it to the eight-year-old. Yeah. Another eight-year-old to an eight-year-old will take 10 seconds because, because they're, on, they're on their level and it's, it's amazing. Man. Yeah, I, I would think see that with the academy I'm working with, you know, with the turnout, they're doing their ball work, and they've got a number seven, doing what he's doing, and then another seven, seven, you know, so now I'm watching what to do. And before he even lifts my mouth, the first player's going, I'll show you. Yeah. And he's showing them straight away, he tells yeah. him, like, saying lesser words, but yeah. more impact. And then the other number, the, the other number seven goes, okay. And they both go off and do it. That's <laughs> it. Brilliant. So, so with this method, then it's the players lead it. I'm within earshot, and then if ever I need to step in, or I think the conversation is is petering out, and they they've reached their point, um, of, of they've got nothing else to say. That's when I step in, and I might expand upon what they've they've said about. Um, there's also you're in position where, if if the conversation starts going in the wrong way, or um, well, I did it with the under nines a couple of weeks ago where they had their conversation and it wasn't about when I had to step in it wasn't about football it was about uh, little Bobby's having a chat and little Johnny's trying to talk over him well, no hang on yeah. little Bobby's talking you have to show respect and then I step out again and then the, the conversation can continue hopefully through that they then build confidence that they can talk to each other they're identifying problems and coming up with the solutions themselves and you know, I've been doing it for a, for a month now and it's really, really powerful and I'm going to continue doing it. So that's then led, so you have the, the player-led conversation and then I come in and either follow on from their conversation and add the, the layer of detail or if there's a couple of things that they haven't um, mentioned, that's when I would add my part to it and try and tell them, show them on a tactics board what you want from them, but ask questions as well. Why am I asking you to do this? And, and try and ask open questions in order to to, to get that engagement um, and to, the, the, to develop their understanding. From that, so you've done the team talk, then it would be maybe have a minute where they're hydrating, they're having a little conversations themselves, and I'm just going around and talking to the individuals. So little Bobby, that would only really impact Bobby and it would be boring for everyone else. I would then go and talk to him in, in the, the detail, maybe with a smaller tactics board to show exactly what you want. If you need to speak to a unit, that's the chance and you can do that as well. While these other guys are just off having water. And then you bring them all back together and 10 seconds before they're about to go out, then it's a quickly, it's either going through the main points just very quickly, but this, this is the headline, we're going to pass the ball quicker. And then it's just about motivating them and sending them out at a high, at a high intensity. And this is a new method I've been in trying to adapt recently. And I've seen, the very best I've seen at doing it is Terry Skiverton um, at Yeovil, where he would summarise that those key messages and send them out like warriors, you know, and they're all pumped up, ready to go in. You can see that this team talk has had an impact on what they then go on and do, and they can improve their performance through that team talk. It's it's another big part of being a coach and something that I'm working hard to improve on. Thank you to everybody who's watched this episode. If you've got any questions, please contact us and we'll add them into the show next week. For now, from myself and Jamie, thank you very much. Goodbye.